Marilyn Manson has been a goth icon for decades now. Once known as Brian Warner, Marilyn isn't so much a character as many have considered him to be. He's unabashedly himself. If you've ever heard a pearl-clutching conservative woman say that children are being converted by demonic Satanist music, there's a pretty good chance she had the image of Marilyn Manson in mind. If you ever met someone that took goth to the next level beyond Hot Topic and into white face makeup with layers of black eyeshadow and terrifyingly pale blue contacts, chances are they may have been inspired by Marilyn Manson to some capacity. Some articles say that Manson almost drifted into the famous for just being famous category as he was and still is to some extent, the very antithesis of preppy jocks and cheerleaders from our old high school years, just in human form. Because of how extreme Marilyn is, his fans tended to be extremely devoted too. Unfortunately, this meant his enemies also went to great lengths to vilify the rock star during his rise to fame. You know how violent video games are often blamed for school shootings now? Well, before Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto, there was Marilyn, and it was his music that was blamed for one of the most notorious shootings in the US, Columbine. Marilyn wrote for Rolling Stone in 1999 and said he was a scapegoat. It was unthinkable that the shooters would do such a thing on their own with no simple black and white motive. Marilyn effectively became that motive. He'd supposedly corrupted them. It didn't matter that they weren't fans of his music to some. Marilyn was the antichrist. Quote, I am the 90s voice of individuality and people tend to associate anyone who looks and behaves differently with illegal or immoral activity. Love him or hate him, the article was well-worded and thought-provoking. Merlin wasn't afraid of outrage. He said it was his job to be a quote, goddamn tornado. And if that's the case, then he sure did that well. I mean, he made an album titled Antichrist Superstar. He smashed beer bottles on his chest during shows. He talked openly about doing drugs and he flicked an interviewer in the testicles. And that's just barely scratching the surface. However, there are also a few things Marilyn has done over the years that, while seemingly are just part of that outrageous personality, are a little bit harder to dismiss. So hello and welcome to Dark Dives. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about Marilyn Manson. Please know that this episode will mention rape, grooming, and abuse extensively. If you're not in the headspace to hear about those topics, I recommend ending the episode here right now. We're going to start by talking about Marilyn's early years of fame and the warning signs, so to speak. For one, the way he treated others, particularly his mother, wasn't an unusual quirky character trait. As Manson himself admitted in the late 90s, it was abusive on his part. In his own memoir, Manson said that he assaulted her with a perfume bottle when he thought she cheated on his dad, scarring her in the process. He often chased her with a microphone stand while screaming and cursing at her. The same treatment went for fans, and in the memoir where he discussed beating and choking his mother, he also recounted an instance where he draped a deaf fan in meat and urinated on her at a recording studio. I guess he thought that was funny too, referring to the fan as a living meat sculpture. And what a way to start the episode, right? And this is only the things that he's admitted to. And this one for his bandmates too. Drummer Kenneth Wilson also spoke out in 1997, saying that if he missed a cue while playing, he might get a mic stand thrown at his skull. In fact, Manson created chaos for just about any place he went, destroying venues and hotels. Manager Tony Chula was supposedly the only one who could tame Manson, and he'd stand there with a checkbook and smile after a rampage. The imagery just reminds me of a horrible parent saying, my little angel could do no wrong, only Manson is a grown man and his supposed tantrums are way worse than any child's. Personally, I don't think it's super badass or hot when a rock star can't control themselves and has the emotional intelligence of a toddler, but you do you, I guess. Maybe this is just chalked up to that rock star lifestyle that, I mean, obviously I'm not aware of, but hey, uh, I guess that's the vibe. Now, in part, thanks to the enabling of those around him, Marilyn could get away with pretty much anything. A security guard working one of his shows in 2001 was sexually assaulted. Manson approached him, wrapped his legs around his neck and gyrated against him while wearing only a leather thong and pantyhose. And no matter who that is, rock star or otherwise, it's kind of disgusting. Like who wants to actually be used as a prop in front of a live audience like that? Again, if it was consensual, discussed beforehand, whatever, you do you. But the understanding of this from what I was reading was that it was not consensually discussed beforehand. 
the sexual assault charge was thrown out, which in my opinion is a bit bullshit. And Manson had to pay a mere $4,000 in fines during the proceedings. The settlement itself was handled privately. According to some, Manson could even get away with murder. The mother of Jennifer Symes sued him in the early 2000s after Marilyn Manson gave Jennifer cocaine at a party. While driving home, Jennifer got into a fatal car accident. Manson told MTV that she'd gone home with a designated driver, arguing against the suit that says he had instructed her to operate a motor vehicle. So was Manson behind the wheel? No, but if this wasn't really a wake up call for him to get his shit together, then I'm not really sure what else would be. Truthfully, it seems like fans either weren't aware of how bad Marilyn's behavior was, or they just didn't care. He was a classic rock star taken up a notch. That's what they do, right? But it gets darker. That same decade, he showed a friend a compilation tape of every woman he'd taken into his closet for oral sex. It's not clear if all of them even knew he was filming or not, but it definitely doesn't seem like they were aware that he'd be showing the videos to his friends. Marilyn also joked about rape extensively. The Rolling Stones said that he'd tell a woman he was going to rape them and crush them under their car. A hilarious joke, I'm sure. And he told his audience in 2009, quote, when you laugh after you fuck her, it's not rape. So the question here is why was all of this behavior excused? Well, because Marilyn Manson is a tortured artistic soul, I suppose. Now, this isn't new or exclusive to Hollywood. Fucking Picasso brutalized his models and called women machines for suffering. But the aesthetic alibi or the idea of art excusing bad behavior and crime is abundant in the modern day. Just look at Harvey Weinstein. He created a culture of silence around himself despite so many people knowing what he'd done or R. Kelly, he also hid in plain sight. And as his abuse became worse, his shows also grew more outrageous, featuring sex cages on stage. While probably two of the most known examples, they're far from alone. In 2017, the New York Times wrote that directors also have, quote, justified the mistreatment or plain resentment of women as a gritty artistic choice. Bernardo Berlucci, director of The Last Tango in Paris, once bragged about not fully informing his actress in regards to the movie's sex scene. He said he wanted her, quote, reaction as a girl, not an actress. So I suppose it's just uber cool to be controlling and abusive. Just make sure you're famous first, of course. However, in my opinion, Marilyn Manson was able to get away with more because of the subculture he was a part of. And hear me out, not all mainstream, straight-laced and suit-wearing folks are good, far from it they're perfectly capable of heinous acts. And not all goth folks or metal and rock lovers are bad. Many are kind hearted and some of the nicest people I've actually met and would never hurt a fly. Still, because society as a whole does tend to demonize the latter and assume that they're more likely to engage in abusive behavior, Marilyn's downright alarming act seemed pretty overlooked because it was supposedly the norm. As The Guardian puts it, they were all part of the backdrop. Manson hadn't even lied about the things that would make your grandma Doris faint. He talked to the public often about BDSM, drugs, Satanism, and put on shows where naked women were dragged around on dog leads. Maybe one could argue that the warning signs of abuse were there and crystal clear, but it's a fine line to walk. Is this a public persona or his personality? After all, BDSM does not equate to abuse in the slightest. And even if Manson wasn't exactly about to get up on stage and teach his audience about what consent means, did he know the meaning himself? Okay, so let me go ahead and start this section out by saying the section is titled in the script, Allegations. So let me make this clear. The rest of the episode, Allegations. These are alleged things. What I've said before, these are things that have been reported in newspapers and have been confirmed one way or another. This new information that I'm going to be presenting onward in this episode are currently alleged. As it stands, these are opinions and accusations that have yet to be proven in court. So with all of that out of the way, let's continue. Now, back in 2017, Marilyn Manson told the world that he doesn't approve of non-consensual sex of any kind and fired his longtime bassist, Twiggy Ramirez. Twiggy's ex, Jessica Adams, accused him of violently raping her when they had been dating in the 90s, and Manson, who said he had not been aware of it, condemned Twiggy. And thank goodness, this proves that his 2009, it's not rape if you laugh and other sick jokes were just jokes, right? Manson doesn't actually approve of rape. Unfortunately, in the coming years, it seemed more and more like firing Twiggy was nothing more than a publicity stunt. Though claims, some of them not naming Manson directly were made in 2018 and 2019, it wasn't until 2021 that Manson was truly thrust under the spotlight. His ex, Evan Rachel Wood, posted on Instagram, quote, "'The name of my abuser is Brian Warner, also known to the world as Marilyn Manson. 
He started grooming me when I was a teenager and horrifically abused me for years. I was brainwashed and manipulated into submission. I am done living in fear of retaliation, slander, or blackmail. I am here to expose this dangerous man and call out the many industries that have enabled him before he ruins any more lives. I stand with the many victims who will no longer be silent." It is worth mentioning that when they met, she was 18 years old and Manson was 36, literally double her age. Now, with the Me Too movement in full swing, the public finally started to realize that his jokes about bashing Rachel's skull in with a sledgehammer maybe weren't all that funny. Other women stepped forward with similar accounts, claiming that everyone passed off his behavior as theatrical, and it wasn't until he truly turned ugly that they realized it wasn't a facade. Esme Bianco told the Rolling Stones that he started off by love bombing her too. It's not as if he was a monster from the beginning, but gradually he allegedly became one. Model Ashley Smithline and Esme Bianco both said he physically abused and sexually assaulted them. Smithline claimed he even carved his initials on her thigh and burned her without his consent for sexual gratification. A vocal booth in his apartment was allegedly converted into basically a torture chamber, or what Manson called the bad girl's room, where he would force his girlfriends to stay for hours on end. Smithline described the psychological torment she endured, claiming, first you fight and he enjoys the struggle. I learned to not fight it because that was giving him what he wanted. I just went somewhere else in my head. Another accuser that wanted to remain anonymous stated that when Manson raped her, he said she was making him do it. Quote, following the alleged assault, Doe says, Warner threatened to kill her, saying he would bash her head in and boasted that he could get away with murdering her because she was a nobody and he was a celebrity who had contacts with the police. Reading the extensive list of claims, if I'm being honest, is downright horrifying. It's crystal clear that Marilyn Manson believed he'd get away with it purely because he's an icon and because by then he was so used to not being held accountable for his actions. Once you read through the suit, it almost feels like there's nothing that Manson hasn't done. We've got groping women in public without consent, keeping his girlfriends as prisoners, forcing them to adhere to a dress code, verbally degrading them during interviews, breaking laws around human trafficking by having them perform for free, cutting women with a knife during sex without consent, and on and on and on. Essentially, Manson told the world who he was long ago. He named himself after Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson. So, I mean, what were we really expecting here? And his band members like Twiggy Ramirez did the same kind of naming thing, obviously Twiggy the model and Ramirez the night stalker. He hid in plain sight, as Bianco put it, because people excuse the actions as a persona, or as we discussed earlier, for the sake of his art. But the thing is, I wouldn't give a shit if Marilyn Manson were the next Beethoven or the next musician in the entire globe, like good music, good talent, or whatever. It should never be a free pass to treat other people like dog shit. Now, he has of course denied these allegations and said that the accusations are merely horrible distortions of reality. But even those who haven't dated him said that he called his room in his house the rape room and that he allegedly filmed up fan skirts. Make no mistake, I don't think Marilyn's lying because he's a loud rock star. I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think it has more to do with the lengthy pattern of abuse and the fact that these women put themselves at risk by standing up against a rock icon like himself. Now, though the case has not been decided, more and more people have begun to realize that even if you liked Marilyn as a musician, there's effectively nothing likable about him as a person. And thus, the fallout has begun. Do you remember Marilyn Manson's enabling manager, Tony Chula, the one that stood by him essentially with a checkbook like Veruca Salt's dad and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Well, even Tony couldn't stand by Marilyn when these allegations came out. He'd stood by Marilyn through plenty of lawsuits in the past, but none were quite like this. None were as damning in the public eye and so damaging to Marilyn's career. He lost out on two television projects, his agency CAA dropped him, and his record label Loma Vista Recordings also kicked him to the curb. He can't tour, he can't release his book, his art shows have been postponed, and I mean, good. I think his career should be stuck in purgatory before this lawsuit takes its course. Though it seems like shortly after the lawsuit, Evan Rachel Wood's documentary, Phoenix Rising, took care of the rest of whatever maybe he was holding on to. Her two-part documentary on HBO detailing her relationship with Manson in her own words and told the world why she believed he'd gotten away with this for so long. 
See, after Columbine, when Manson was wrongfully vilified, his music was seen as performance art and commentary. He'd been falsely accused of such a horrific act before, so anyone wanting to call him a monster again would effectively have to deal with his fan base vehemently defending him, saying that you just don't understand his art. The Atlantic wrote, quote, a strange twist is that the aftermath of Columbine seems to have enabled Manson to become what Wood's brother describes in the documentary as a wolf in wolf's clothing. The hysterical invented accusations leveled at Manson then that he molested children on stage, killed animals, had his security guards drug underage fans with liquid ecstasy, minimized other things that might've been happening in plain sight. Marilyn Manson said that Wood's allegations were coordinated alongside a dozen other women to take him down basically accusing these women of crying wolf against him. But it's not just women that have spoken out against Marilyn Manson, but girls too. Jane Doe says that when she met Marilyn in the 1990s, she was only 16 years old. He invited her onto his tour bus and took down her address and phone number, along with a few other girls in her group. Fully aware of her age, Manson allegedly performed forced copulation and penetration on Doe, though she wasn't the age of consent. According to the Rolling Stone, Doe was scared and in pain when Marilyn laughed because I guess according to him, that doesn't make it rape, right? And he told her to get the fuck off his bus or he'd kill her and her family. After all, he had their addresses to do so. Traumatized from the event, Doe turned to drugs and alcohol as Manson kept calling her and asking for explicit photos of her and her friends. He convinced her to travel for another one of his concerts where he sexually assaulted her again before acting in a more kinder, love-bombing manner that we've heard others speak of. Seemingly believing he actually cared for her, Doe spent weeks on the road with Manson and his tour group, taking drugs with him and remaining isolated from her family. She also claims that his record labels were all aware of what was happening at the time. They just didn't have any precautions in place whatsoever to protect her. It was the 90s after all, and these conversations around sexual assault and grooming weren't really happening the way they are today. But this still isn't all of it. Wood's allegations in lawsuit opened the floodgates, and although a lot of the information released about Manson focused on the sexual abuse allegations, there's a lot more concerning behavior that we still haven't touched upon yet shit that can't be excused as art unless you're truly deluded, at least in my opinion. Have you ever left a cart full of items in an online store because the shipping costs were maybe just a little bit too expensive? I know I have. And did you know that shipping costs are also the number one reason for abandoned carts? In a landscape where free and fast shipping has become the norm, it can be hard for smaller e-commerce businesses to compete. So keep yourself competitive with ShipStation because when you use ShipStation, you can lower shipping costs, you can make returns easy, and of course, keep your customers happy. And ShipStation effortlessly integrates everywhere you sell online, including Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, and more. You can manage every order from one simple dashboard, automate routine shipping tasks, print shipping labels, easily compare rates and delivery times to optimize every single shipment, and automate delivery notifications too. And you can get up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. And if that's not enough, use my promo code to try ShipStation free for two months. Over 130,000 companies have grown their e-commerce businesses with ShipStation. And 98% of companies that stick with ShipStation for a year become customers for life. So keep your business growing all year long with ShipStation. Use promo code CASKET today at ShipStation.com to sign up for your free 60-day trial. Again, that's ShipStation.com, promo code CASKET. As time wore on, Marilyn's past actions became less for art's sake and a little bit more alarming. Now, looking back at old articles, he seems less goth and creepy and far more terrifying. Back in 2009, for example, The Guardian said that he threatened journalists with violence. At the time, maybe fans were quick to say that, hey, that's just who he is, but in hindsight, it looks a little more like he's a genuinely dangerous person that doesn't want the truth to come out. For example, the owner of the blog Buddyhead, Travis Keller, described Manson as, quote, cocaine-addled, trucker-cap-wearing buffoon. This happened after Manson allegedly got bored during a Zeppelin reunion gig because he only knew the song Stairway to Heaven. Manson responded with, quote, I can but do not need to defend myself from the absurd accusations that the average press has clinged to. I am far different than the soon to be murdered in their home press has decided to fabricate. And if one more journalist makes a cavalier statement about me and my band, I will personally, or with my fans' help, greet them at their home and discover just how much they believe in their freedom of speech. And my dude, my guy, for fuck's sake, I'm not saying that you can't be pissed at being called a buffoon or being insulted. Nobody likes that, I get it. 
And you have every right to say, hey, like, fuck you. You're being an overly critical asshole. That's perfectly fine. And if for whatever damn reason, Marilyn Manson happened to stumble upon this episode, by all means, you can leave a comment and you can totally say I'm a piece of shit. I really don't care. But to threaten someone's life and tell them that they're going to find out just how much they value their freedom of speech, that's a whole next level type of insult. Like you're kind of threatening to kill somebody. Plus, and again, in my opinion, this really goes to show that he just isn't some tough, badass rocker. Actual tough people can take critique and they also know the difference between constructive criticism and hate. Marilyn Manson is clearly a sensitive man child if this is how he responds to a blogger in 2009. Not to mention Marilyn Manson has a giant fan base. Think about how he's using his audience, sicking his friends on some blogger. That never turns out well, let alone with ones devoted and as loyal as his. You don't know exactly who your fans are or what they're capable of, and this could have led to an incredibly awful consequence. But there's plenty more that people have discovered about Manson too, like how his obsession with the swastika and Nazi symbolism wasn't just for the aesthetics, allegedly again. Evan Rachel Wood said that Marilyn Manson claimed Hitler was the first rock star, and though she thought his obsession with Hitler on stage was always ironic and a commentary on Nazism, he actually believed what he was singing. Wood herself is Jewish, and over the course of their relationship, Manson didn't just make fun of her, but he apparently wrote, kill all Jews above the bedroom wall where she slept. He also apparently got multiple swastika tattoos and even beat her with a whip that he claimed the Nazis had used. And this isn't, you know, for the fucking irony anymore. When you write, kill all Jews above your Jewish girlfriend's bedroom wall, that's not funny. I get that fans may say, hey, Marilyn Manson is all about pushing boundaries. That's one thing, but when is the line fucking crossed? Is this not the line? Is the sexual assault not the line? Like, where is the line? When does this go from being intense, ironic, and larger than life to the point of being dangerous? I'd argue he actually crossed that line a long time ago. Wood also explained that because her mother converted to Judaism and raised her that way, she wasn't Jewish by blood. Manson allegedly told her that that was better, but still drew swastikas all over her bedside if he was mad at her. But don't worry, Manson wasn't just anti-Semitic. apparently, he was also racist too, and apparently reveled in using the N-word over and over. Is there anything good about Manson as a person other than his talent? That's the question that truly lies here, and it certainly doesn't seem that way. It really does seem that he was a wolf in wolf's clothing. And though he told the world who he was, he also convinced the world that it was only a persona at the same time. Former bandmates have also said the same thing with one former guitarist, Wes Borland, sharing on podcast Space Zebra, quote, I'm sorry to everyone on this podcast right now who doesn't like this, but that guy, he's amazingly talented, but he's fucked up and he needs to be put in check and he needs to get sober and he needs to come to terms with his demons. He's a bad fucking guy. I was there when he was with Evan Rachel Wood. I was at his house. It's not fucking cool. That's all I'm gonna say about it. Now, we all know that separating the art from the artist is hard. I've talked about it before with the JK Rowling episode and Harry Potter. And to my understanding anyway, many Harry Potter lovers still love the world building itself, but they try not to give Rowling herself any more money. She and the Harry Potter world, though they'll obviously always be tied, are not the same thing. but can you really make that separation? And the same question goes to Marilyn Manson and his artistry. Because I think that question gets a little harder with him, if not downright impossible to do, because he is his art. So was it a persona? It's a bit hard to say. I don't know if you can love his song called Baboon Rape Party when he actually raped people, allegedly, or the song Man That You Fear when people did literally fear him. Of course, these are my opinions. If you enjoy Marilyn Manson's music, that's absolutely your call. And I'm not gonna tell you what to listen to or not. It just hits different, way different, knowing that potentially a Nazi loving, woman hating, tantrum having and controlling asshole Marilyn Manson allegedly is all of those things. And again, in my opinion, no amount of talent can really excuse that. Now, here's the thing, that was going to be the end of this episode. Those were my final thoughts on the matter. But as of writing this, a massive break in the case is formed. One of Marilyn Manson's alleged victims recanted her claims, saying she was under pressure from Evan Rachel Wood. 
And this is fucking huge if it's true because no one should ever feel obligated to accuse someone of sexual assault. And obviously no one should ever be the victim of a false accusation. Now, I don't have any idea what this means for Evan Rachel Wood's claims. This doesn't necessarily make her a liar, but it certainly does not make her look good. And this is why it's so important to be crystal clear that allegations are just that, allegations. While at the same time, it's also important to take them very seriously and let evidence speak for itself. Furthermore, this new information does actually lend some credibility to Manson, saying that this was an orchestrated attack. While at the same time, it doesn't mean he hasn't raped anyone either. Smithline, who recanted her story, told Billboard, "'While at first I knew Mr. Warner did not do those things to me, I eventually began to question whether he actually did. On numerous occasions, I was told that I may just be misremembering what happened, repressing my memories of what happened, or that my memories had not yet surfaced, which they said happened to people against whom these acts were perpetrated. What I find so infuriating here is that Smithline alleges other victims reached out to her. And when she told them she hadn't been abused, these victims told her she might not be remembering it. You ultimately can't demand that we believe all women while at the same time telling Smithline you don't believe that she wasn't abused. This might mean that other victims of Marilyn Manson were pressured. It might also mean that just Smithline was pressured. I don't truly know. But one thing is for sure, regardless of these specific allegations, Marilyn Manson is ultimately an asshole. We just don't know how much of an asshole for sure, and it's absolutely going to be one messy road to get to the bottom of it. But with all of that being said, these are just my thoughts, my opinions, a whole bunch of sources on information and what's going on in today's episode, but that is where we are ending today's episode. I hope you learned something new here today. If you did, Thank you so much for sticking it out all the way to the end. I know this was not one of those easy episodes to listen to today, but I do appreciate your time all the same. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.